So good morning, good afternoon, everyone. We are so excited that you have joined us for the Leadership Now series. And if you are new to this format, what we really believe at Driven Leadership is that we believe in building a strong community of same type of thought leaders, you know, mentors, teachers. We believe that everyone has a story, a message. We have business leaders, owners, um, coaches, athletic coaches like Kate today. We've had individuals who are out there making a difference. And part of what this is, is to share their message so that they give us tips and tools on what they're doing that's working. So it continues to encourage us. Those of you who are watching this on Facebook Live, if you're making comments, we won't be able to see them until after this. Um, you need to come into the Zoom webinar to actually interact. And if you are in here in the Zoom webinar, we like to make this interactive. So on your chat, if you have just comments, you can chat away. And then if you have a question for Kate, uh, put that in the Q&A and then we will bring that to her at a later time towards the end. Next week on um, Tuesday at 1130, we have Sophia Rose Alexander, who will be talking on the power of a mentor, which actually goes a lot into what Kate's going to share today. And Sophia, oh my gosh, I've known her for 11, 12 years, and she was absolutely the networking queen of the Irvine Chamber in Orange Beach or Irvine, California. She was a connector of connectors. She built all of these leads groups. She's since retired and now is involved in five nonprofits. And her passion is really about how to create communities, how to mentor and coach. So you'll want to join us for that. So as we get into Kate, you know, and I say Babs, that is the, you know, your nickname from Bold. I am so honored you are here. And Thank you for rescheduling. Those of you who were actually on, supposed to be on this two weeks ago, my power went out. We had a fire locally. We were down for 24 hours. And so we were shifting and pivoting. <laughs> Everything happens for a reason. Yep. And I am, I just love just who you are and what you stand for. And I know your topic is loving yourself. You are enough. And before we get into that, let's just do a quick introduction. Just let the viewers know who you are and what you're about. Yeah, awesome. Good morning. I'm Babs <laughs> or Kate McCarthy or Coach Kate. Most people um, know me by Coach Kate in my professional world. And, you know, I'm a West Virginia girl, born and raised. I'm very proud of that. Um, grew up in West Virginia to a big old family. I have seven siblings. My mom was a teacher. My dad was a college professor. So grew up around, um, you know, knowledge is power and education is really important. So, you know, growing up with eight kids and kind of running around, um, we never needed playmates. Being grounded was difficult because, you know, we always had people in the house to play with. And I remember watching my older brothers. I'm number seven of eight. And I remember watching my siblings play all these different sports and me saying, mom, can I do that? Mom, can I do that? And finally, when soccer came to our little town, I said, mom, can I play soccer? And she goes, yeah, you can play soccer. And so then started this life journey passion for me. I've been playing soccer longer than I've been going to school. Okay. Fun wow. fact. I skipped kindergarten as a little kid and I jumped into first grade in October when I was four years old and I had started soccer in August of that year. And so I played soccer longer than I went to school. Um, so you jumped, you started first grade at four? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, anyway, so I remember poking my head in the door in first grade and my dad and my teacher saying, do you recognize anybody? And I had a friend in there and her name was Sarah. We're still friends. And she was like, Kate's on my soccer team. So anyway, right. So that was kind of my passion. And so, you know, I grew up playing multiple sports, three sport athletes, small town. Everybody kind of did that. Played college soccer, uh, Davis and Elkins College. And I developed such a great relationship with my head coach. I, he is an incredible human being. He's a wonderful husband and father. He taught me a ton as a coach. And I remember sitting in his office thinking, I think you're amazing. I respect you. How do I have your life? 
and I pretty much phrased it, how do I get your job? And he said, well, you know, um, you need to go be a graduate assistant. And at that time, you know, when I became a freshman in college, I was already coaching youth in my local town. So I coached all four years through college. And then I said, but how do I coach college? Like, how do I coach this age? And he said, go be a graduate assistant. Okay. So I picked up and I moved to Bemidji, Minnesota. I was a graduate assistant. I studied sports studies, got my master's degree, loved my experience there. And I taught college classes. I coached. I also had a bachelor's degree in physical education. So I knew my passion was in teaching. I just didn't know if I wanted to teach in a school setting or coach. Grad school kind of gave me the, the ability to do both. And I realized I like teaching, but I love coaching. And coaching is teaching. Mm -hmm. So that kind of combines all of my things. So from there, I took a job um, in Iowa, coached there for three years. I took a head coaching job in Illinois, was there for four years at a division three school. And then I've just recently the last two years now relocated to Bakersfield, California, and I'm the assistant coach here at California State University, Bakersfield, Division I school. And that's so, where I met you. And that's where we met at Bold, right? So that's kind of my uh, quick little blurb of my background and who I am and, um, you know, where I'm at now. I love the fun fact. I had no idea that you played soccer longer than you were in school. And yeah. to be a first grader at four years old, there's like a two year gap there. Yeah. So the story behind that actually ties into my topic a little bit today. We did family council every Sunday, all the kids, we'd go to church. I'm, I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And so we go to church on Sunday, we come home, eat lunch, and we all sit around our big old table. Dad would pull out his calendar and we'd go through the week soccer practice, Boy Scouts, volunteering, who's got this, right? Like, it was crazy. And um, we, you know, we're getting to the end of the summer and my brother says, my dad goes, oh, Kate's gonna go take her test to go to school, yay! And I always wanted to go to school, like my siblings. I'm like, oh, this is great. And my big brother turns to me and he goes, you know, if you pass that test, you gotta get a big shot and it's this big, and they jab it in your arm, and it hurts, and I was like, oh, I mean, I have this nasty fear of needles, so I went to that test, and I intentionally failed. Oh. I did not want to get that shot, because passing that test meant going to school, meant getting the shot, so I remember sitting there as the woman saying, okay, just, you know, tell us what you see, and she'd hold up a card, and I would change the answer. So I remember her holding up a red wagon and I was like, violin. And then she kind of looked at my mom like, what? And a couple cards later, she holds up a violin. I'm like, red wagon. And so at the end, they're like, not only is your daughter not ready for school, but we think she needs a lot of help academically. So of course, my parents freak out. They get me a tutor, a retired teacher down the road. I work with her for three months. In three months, she realizes my secret. I tell her I'm now reading chapter books and doing all sorts of upper level math for my age. And she says, I think you need to have Kate retested. Wow. Isn't that amazing though? At four years old, you have the ability to understand that there's pain and pleasure and to be able to shift it so that you don't, no matter how much you wanted it, that you were able to play the card at four years old to make sure that you didn't have to go through the pain. Very clearly. Absolutely. That was very intentional. So how does that tie into loving yourself? You're good enough. Yeah. You know, and one of the things with loving yourself, you know, is a lot of times we knock ourselves down, you know, whether we want to fit in the crowd, we want people to like us, you know, in a sports studies class I took in graduate school, there's a very simple concept. It says, generally men operate on a pyramid. They all want to be at the top, king of the hill. They love it. They respect that guy, but they also want to beat him and replace him. And it's done in this competitive way that is healthy and guys are all about it and they're still friends. If girls operate on a pyramid and want to be at the top, they hate this girl. They do not respect her and they do not want her part of the group. He is ostracized. So many women and girls want to focus on a spider web. 
They want to be in the middle of the web and they're, they care about relationships. Am I accepted? Am I liked? Do I have friends? Do people invite me over? Am I pretty? Am I okay? Am I good enough? And they want to fit into that mold so they don't rock the boat. They're surrounded by the people they love and then they go about their business. So a lot of times, especially with young girls, this is one of my passions. You know, if a girl is very smart or very talented or fast or strong or she can kick a ball and she's better than people around her, she has a choice. And many girls will choose to pull themselves back. Mm. You know, literally, if they were in a race and someone says, oh, well, she's fast. She's fast like the boys. And, you know, and you put that girl in a race, she has a choice. Does she still go race and try to beat the boys? Or does she slow herself down to make friends? Mm -hmm. And I see that every age, every sport, all the time, you know? Well, and it's not just in sports. We see that in the world. In the world. Because it's the strong women who have leadership roles. They're referred to as, you know, bitch. Right. <laughs> or, right. And it's just, who do you think you are? You know, I've yeah. never heard it that way. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, so loving yourself, you know, to me, it's a simple definition. It's, it's ultimately the value you put on yourself as a human being. And how do I value myself, right? And, and as a society, we let all these outside sources dictate to us our worth. How do you look? How do you dress? You know, so much for young girls is about body image. You know, are you smart? Are you thin? Do you, are you in a relationship? I mean, a lot of people gauge their worth by, am I in a relationship? Mm -hmm. Do I have a date to prom? Am I married with children? Right? And that status relationship says, oh, okay, I'm a good person. I have worth. Right? Um, and that's not true. That's not true. And so we have all these outside sources, especially in advertising. Oh, my goodness. You see the advertising of the world now. And, and it basically tells us in some sort of way, you're not quite good enough, but if you buy this product, you will be, or you could be. Yeah. Right. So did you ever struggle with self-worth? I have struggled with self-worth, um, a couple times. The biggest one, um, was honestly coming out as bisexual and my sexuality really conflicting with the way I grew up, my faith, some of my family, but ultimately it was like this identity of like, oh my gosh, who am I? Who is Kate? So that was a process. That was a long process. When I was a kid, um, I remember many, many times almost the same story happening where someone would say, oh, you're just like one of the boys you know, Kate's so fast and she's so good and she can do this and she can climb trees and she can throw a ball and she plays football at recess. And as I got older, boys would say, oh, I would date you if you dressed more like a girl or if you looked more feminine. And I went to high school and, oh, you know, I think you're really cool and you've got a great personality, but you're just not girly enough for me. You know, and then I'd go to college. Oh, you know, Kate, you're, you're awesome. You're like my best friend, but there's no way we could ever date. I mean, you're just, you don't wear enough makeup, hmm. you know? Um, or you won't do things in a relationship that satisfy me. So sorry, I'm not interested, even though I think you're great. And so there was all these conditions. If you did this, I would be interested. And over and over in my life, I had to make a decision of, okay, do I want to oblige? Do I want to change? And I didn't, I didn't, I said, you know what, this is me. This is who I am. Take it or leave it. I'm a shorts and t-shirt kind of girl. Jeans and a V-neck is dressed up for me. You know, I love sports. I love the arts. I love music. I love being outside, but like, this is me. Take it or leave it. So yes and no. You know, I think everybody goes through that in their life multiple times. I don't think it stops. I think you kind of continue having to reevaluate and telling yourself at different points in your life, I am enough. I love myself. 
I am of worth. Well, and, and you're talking about the expectations, right? And it starts at such a young age. And, and I always say our parents, our caregivers, they do the best they can with the tools they have. And yet there's expectations put on us from a very young age about how, what we're going to do, how we're going to follow rules. There's education expectations. We get into school, we play sports. There's um, athletic expectations. There's society, you, go, you, know, you hit the, the weight, um, what we look like, what schools we go to, what neighborhoods we live in, how much yep. money we make. I mean, there's all these expectations. Yep. And I remember um, when we worked with CSUB, the girls it was two years ago, and you and I were talking and we were, at that time, I think you were working with U8 and now you're with U6. And seeing, and, and this is one of the things I'm, I'm so passionate about too, is because we have the ability to reset and to change if we're aware of it. Mm -hmm. And what parents, what mentors, what role models, what they think that they're doing right sometimes is actually tying into taking away the self-worth of a child because underneath they think, well, if I'm not fast enough, if I'm not smart enough, if I don't get this grade, then I'm not going to be loved. If yeah. I can't play, if I can't start, that means I'm not good enough. I'm not going to be loved. Yep, I see it all the time. And I remember you telling me a story about how these kids, they just, they work, work, work. There's all these expectations with club um, and that they were going to give them two weeks off. Mm -hmm. what, what do you see, especially at a younger age, that if coaches, if parents could shift a little bit, would help their child step into even more of loving themselves? I don't know that we have enough time for this question, but I'm going to do my best. I could write a book about this um, and all my opinions. A couple things. Results do not equal love. Love is unconditional. Self-love and hopefully the love we give to the, those we care about. Um, so a couple things. Paying kids to score goals is one of my highest pet peeves. I'll give you $5 if you score a goal. I'll give you a dollar every juggle you make. And all of a sudden, immediately that child connects. I get a reward. I, I get this money if I accomplish this, this, or this. So they could go out, play an amazing game, be a good teammate, have a good work rate, speak kindly to the refs, pick a teammate up if they make a mistake. They can cheer on the bench. They give a good attitude and body language. But if they don't score that goal and they get in the car, and someone says, well, no money for you today. You didn't score a goal. Boom. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that all of these wonderful traits that we want them to, to live by, they just did. It went unnoticed because the money reward didn't happen. So first off, don't pay your kids for success. You know, that also breeds in my mind, this extrinsic versus intrinsic where we immediately connect with children. If I do this, then I get this. And it's this extrinsic reward versus saying, if I work hard, I can feel good about myself. If I practice this skill and increase juggling from five to 20, I can celebrate that because I've just gotten better. So I always joke, my players always say, what do we get if we win? And my answer is always bragging rights, mm -hmm. pride joy happiness you know and they just kind of look at me and i try to instill that so that's a big one for parents that goes along with the mindset with carol dweck Do, have you ever read that book the no. fixed versus growth mindset oh yeah 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 okay. yeah it's it's the fixed mindset is all resorts um results oriented so if i do this this equals that where yep. the growth mindset is it's the effort, it's the attitude, it's yeah. what happens, the work that pull, ties into the results that you get. Right. You know, and so same thing, talking about wins and losses, you know, in youth sports, it shouldn't be about wins and losses. Did you have fun? Mm -hmm. Were you a good teammate? Did you give it your all today? Did you control and give the best things in your reach? Yes great job. Let's go get some ice cream. That treat I'm okay with. Like celebrating that. It's not a condition. It's a, man, what a great job. Let's go have a moment as a family. Right. And 
And that is so important. All too many times, you know, game ends, parents come over, you know, well, that's a tough loss today. Or, oh, you made that mistake in the box. Or, oh, you missed that one in front of the goal. Or, well, you should have made that save. And it's immediately critiquing, critiquing, critiquing. I'm like, look, Mm -hmm. they have a coach for a reason. And we might not see it all and say it all. And not that you can't talk to your kids, but it's the immediate moment after practices and games and performance when they're high stressed their bodies are tired, their little minds and hearts are fragile. That is the moment to say, I'm so proud of you. I love watching you play. It chokes me up because you see, and I mean, I have grandkids and I watch them play and, you know, being able to work with a lot of the college sports teams, you see the heart. They go out there and they put their all into it. And I know that everyone is different every day. You know, they're all, their 100% is different today than maybe tomorrow's game or yesterday's game. But what you said was, did you give it your all? Did you do the best that you can? We all make mistakes. And, you know, this ties into the business realm too, because what we learn as children, as young adults, if we're not aware of it, if there's not a shift in the mindset or even, oh my God, I'm doing this, we will do it to our coworkers, to the people that we lead and manage. We do it to our own children, to our relationships and partnerships. Yep, yep. And, you know, also I think in the business sector and when you get into professional sports and college sports, talking about scholarships, you know, something that I know that we connect value and worth is how much scholarship we get Mm -hmm. or the salary that we are offered or the raise that we're given. And I remember sitting in a a coach's conversation. This is what I was going to tell you earlier. And we were recruiting this girl. And the coach says, we love you. We think you're great. I'm so happy you're here. We think you're worth this much money. And the girl and her parents kind of continued. And I went, you know, didn't say anything. We continued the meeting. She left. And I just kind of had a conversation. I just said, hey, I really want us to focus on saying your soccer skills are worth this. And it was like, well, what do you mean? Of course I mean that. I'm like, in your mind, it's assumed she hears that her as a human being, you find that her value is only or whatever worth this much money. And then her parents hear that. And I said, we need to disconnect. My worth as a human being is infinite. You cannot put a dollar amount on the worth of a human being. My soccer skills or my skills as a coach, sure, you can put a dollar amount on that. If I deserve a raise, it is someone's loyalty or their work ethic, or maybe they hit their numbers that month. Maybe they exceeded their numbers. That and those skills, that can be worth a raise. But to say you, you are worth, no, that's that's false. That's incorrect. I remember hearing a story once where there was a a guy who his parents had invested, invested, invested in him. He was playing for one of the colleges and he didn't get to start. And the dad looked at him and said, I have put a million dollars into you. You don't deserve to play if you don't start. And I just went, oh my gosh. Yep. So we talk about expectations And it's so much bigger than athletics. It's so much bigger because it's part of everything that we do. When you said it is the root of who we are and everything that we do, we have to understand our value. Yep. And so when you get these young kids, young women who come in and you see that they're struggling with their self-worth because mental illness is so high. I mean, some of the coaches we work with are like, we are seeing things that we've never dealt with before because the level of pressure, the fear of failure, when we work with, um, especially the young adults, their fear, their number one fear is fear of failure. Yep. Fear of that if they fail, that someone's going to be disappointed, that they don't measure up. And you carry that into our adult life and it's hard to shake that. Yes. Yes, so how do you teach them? So a couple different ways. Um, I am probably overly positive. 
I'm a believer that as a coach, if someone makes one mistake, I don't need to rip them apart. They generally already are. We will talk harsher to ourselves than anybody else generally. So one mistake on the field in practice, she's already correcting herself and talking bad to herself. My job is to say, hey, try the next one, get the next one, bounce back. Now, the correction in my mind comes from if they make the same mistake two, three, four, five times, then they either are struggling with the skill or they're not understanding what I'm asking of them and I need to coach, I need to step in and help them. But being overly positive, especially after mistakes to bounce back and be resilient. That's big. Another one is making um, mental health awareness the norm. And this is what I tell my girls. I, I say this all the time. If your tooth hurts and you need to go see someone, you go to the dentist. If I break my arm, I go get it fixed. I go to the doctor. If I have problems reading and seeing, I go to the eye doctor. If I am having problems with mental and emotional health, go to the doctor. It's that simple. We go to the doctor to take care of all parts of our body. That is the root of our body that keeps everything flowing. And we need to make sure that we're in balance. We need to make sure that we have support. We need to make sure that we get help when we need to. And there is zero shame in saying, you know what? I could use a little doctor checkup right now. Let's go talk to somebody. And making it that normal to say out loud, oh, yeah, I went to the therapist today. Oh, I went to the counselor today. And have no one in the room blank, blank. Right. Just say, okay, how was that? Oh, great, okay, feeling good? Great, all right, so what do you want for lunch, right? It just needs to be an everyday part of life. Do you ever work with um, young men? I work with currently young, young boys in my club goalkeeping setting, yeah. Because you talk about the pyramid and men – are typically taught, suck it up. We don't yep. show emotions. My yep. grandsons wrestle and I'm like, oh my God, they're like, suck it up. And they're just pouring their heart out and they're crying and it's just like, stop, stop, stop. And not, I mean, and they know part of it isn't to just dis, you know, credit what they're doing because they need them to get refocused back into it. Yep. So you get the health, right? The pyramid and you get the strong people. How do you teach them especially if they have influences in their life that it's not okay. How do you teach them it's okay? How can you be that support system for them? I think for boys especially, a great way is they have examples. If I'm a young man and my father never shows emotion, he never cries, he never says I love you, he never hugs me, you know, then that is my example. If my father has a bad day at work or his mother passes away and I see him cry, that is a normal response to a very sad thing. And I get to see a man in my life showing emotion and an appropriate reaction to something. Just like on the other side, if you have a coach or a father, brother, whatever, some uh, uh, um, an example to you, that person gets angry and they punch a hole in the wall. And you see that over and over and over. Well, that is your example of what you think is acceptable when you get angry, right? And so having examples that encourage that openness to feel the emotion. And I don't know, I think my take on it is it's not that we should let emotions control us. It's that we should say, you know what? This has happened. It hurt. It's sad. It's frustrating. It's disappointing okay, feel that motion. What's next? Right. Move on. Yeah. And I think the bigger lesson, instead of saying boys don't cry, we should say, okay, how do you bounce back? Okay. You didn't win that wrestling match. How can we get you better? What technique can we do to improve you? What, how were you talking to yourself? Were you beating yourself up or were you excited to get out there and maybe win the next point? And talking more about that resiliency and that confidence and that belief instead of just put a lid on it, you know, um, just putting a lid on things does nothing but let it explode later on. Oh my gosh. I have the analogy once with that is that someone said, it's like shoving things in a garbage can. Like you shove, 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 you're putting a lid on it. And all of a sudden now the garbage is overflowing. The lids come off and you explode and people are like, what the heck just happened? 
yeah. it's because yeah. you've put a lid on it for so long that you don't know how to deal with it. Yep. So I think examples, I think thinking bigger picture instead of that tiny little moment, you know, big picture, what's going on? Where's the emotion coming from? What's the lesson, right? What's the lesson? What can we learn? How can we get better? How can we improve this relationship even, you know? Um, I, I think that's huge. So how does forgiveness tie into loving yourself? Ooh, girl, you're talking about all sorts of books here. Um, we are not perfect. This is going to be tied for me into my faith. You know, faith as a Christian um, and my belief in Jesus Christ and heavenly parents and to say, okay, I'm a child of God. I believe that we were sent to earth, given this amazing body. We all have a purpose. We have amazing gifts. We also have flaws and challenges. And our purpose mainly is to live life the best we can with what we're given. And we learn and build relationships along the way. That free agency that we have to make choices means that we're going to mess up. And again, with my faith, you know, I believe in the resurrection where, you know, Jesus died for my sins. And in the garden of Gethsemane, he took my sins upon the world. So that helps me in a couple ways. One, I am never alone, ever. Even in my darkest hour, when I feel like no one understands me, no one can know how I feel or what I'm going through, I have to remind myself, Jesus Christ already felt this. He knows exactly where I am. He knows exactly what I'm feeling. And he is right there beside me. And I have survived 100% of my bad days. Mm. Keep it up. So that forgiveness has to come in that perfection isn't, it, we're not expected to be perfect. We are expected to learn and grow and experience and be better. And with that comes forgiveness and grace, right? And if we practice that on ourselves, and this is my big thing with self-worth too, is we have to love ourselves before anything else. To me, when I look through my top core, five core values, and I, I kind of went through this um, exercise once to figure out my top five, to me, everything falls under self-worth. Positivity, self-worth. Confidence, self-worth right? Relationships falls under self-worth. In my heart and my mind, self-worth is the root of all things. And I even have self-worth. I don't even have God in my top five because God falls under self-worth. Hmm. If I understand that I am a child of God and I love myself, that means I have a relationship with God. So that falls under that umbrella for me. So it's... <laughs> That, that forgiveness and grace and understanding that I'm going to love myself, especially when I mess up, I'm going to give myself that grace. If I can do that for me, then I sure as heck better be able to do that for other people and understand and extend that forgiveness and that grace and seeking to understand other people and where they're coming from and their self-worth as a human being and as a child of God. Love that. I love what you said. We're not expected to be perfect. We're expected to learn and grow. And in learning and growing, there's no perfection. Like that's, we fall down, we mess up. That's how we learn. We learn what works. We always put the analogy of a child that's learning how to walk. You know, we don't beat a child up because they don't know how to take a step when they're born. Like it's a process. And then when they get into the process and they stand up and they fall down, we become their biggest advocate and cheerleader. Mm -hmm. We don't expect them to run before they can walk. Yep. And as adults, we forget that. And it's giving ourselves grace and going, you know what? I screwed up there. Okay. Mm -hmm. But at the core, who am I? Yep. I was li listening to something today and the speaker said, we don't have to um, discover and he's talking about our worth. It, well, no, he said, we need to discover. It's not that we need to get it. It's already there. So it's discovering that piece that's already inside of you. Yep. So how, what would you do? And I know you've mentored so many people. What are some of the things that you've done 
to help people who are really struggling with their identity and people listening here, whether they're a youth, um, an adult, what would you say to them? Well, um, I encourage them to find what matters to them. You know, if there's someone of faith, I encourage people to pray and develop that relationship with the higher being that they believe in and have that connection. I think that spiritual peace and growth is huge for a lot of people. Um, you know, I encourage people, <laughs> I encourage people to serve others. Mm -hmm. To me, when I get out in my community and I am talking and speaking and smiling and making eye contact and acknowledging other human beings in any capacity, and, and in that moment of just helping, I don't expect anything in return. I don't expect a thank you. I don't expect some big publicity thing. I'm a human being helping another human being right now. And in that moment of this compassion and love, I think we start to realize, wow, this is important. This, these people are important. This person or this family is important. Wow, we're all important. This matters. And I think community service in a way gets us out of our own mind to a bigger picture that then allows us to come back to ourselves and reflect on ourselves. I am going to actually open it up for anyone who has, if they have questions for Kate or comments, um, if you would just put that in the Q&A and I'll read them. Um, I'm going to read this. Kirill said, and Kirill's on here, write that book. Uh -huh. absolutely write that book you know kate you when i think about you and just listening to you there's always these different layers of you that i get to see and you are one of the most passionate inspiring individuals and i know that life's not always easy and there's a lot of disappointments and you know one of my favorite sayings is our mess becomes our message mm -hmm. and you're walking in that message so what do you wish that people knew about you? Ooh, I'm Kate. I don't need a label. In fact, I hate labels. I know it's how we identify. It's how we find commonalities and similarities with people and whatever. But at the end of the day, I'm Kate. Mm -hmm. That's all you need to know. And truly, if you want to get to know other human beings, start with that. Start with the name, you know? I am a person who has made many mistakes and I'm sure I'll continue to make many more. I love deeply. And a lot of people think that living with such outward compassion and positivity makes me soft. I get that a lot. You're soft. You're not hard enough. You don't yell enough. You're not competitive enough. Well, then you really don't know me. I believe that I can be extremely competitive and compassionate. Mm -hmm. I believe that we can have a winning team where girls love each other and embrace each other and support each other and celebrate diversity and strengths and weaknesses and win and not just hate each other and be clicky and you know whatever. Um, I could go on and on but I, I truly think the way we think about ourselves, the way we talk to ourselves, the way we talk to other people, the way we allow other people to talk in our presence, that also creates patterns. Mm -hmm. And that creates those messages that go over and over in our head. So if I say, I'm not good enough, mm -hmm. and then I hear someone else say, she's not good enough. And I hear someone else say, oh, she'll never make it. Mm -hmm. Those become the messages in my brain. If I'm around people and they're making you know, racist or homophobic or whatever comments and language, and I don't say anything, then I'm allowing that to be said. And I'm accepting that, right? If I let people, you know, talk down to me and degrade me, then I'm accepting that. Mm -hmm. and so I think the way, especially when I'm coaching kids, one of the biggest things I talk about is what are you saying to yourself right now? What is the message in your head right now? And they usually go, not good. And I go, okay, fix it. 
And when I was a head coach, I started a tradition, one of my very first or my first season there as a head coach. Before every game, I had the girls put tape around their cleats and I had them write down the reason why they play. Mm. And then we went around and we share it. And one of the reasons why I picked, I have my girls for my team. And on the other cleat, I have a girl, her, I put Haley. It was a former player who passed away in an accident. Mm. And I have the girls write this down. And I say, why do I have it on your feet? And it took them a few minutes. And finally, a girl says, because when we get hard on ourselves, you put your head down and you look down. Ooh, I got goosebumps. I'm like, that's right. Wow. You look down. And you realize this is why I love soccer. This is why I play. This is what motivates me. And you pick your head back up and you play on. Wow. Whew. All right. Krill has a question for you. I love that. Um, yeah. Krill says, what do you feel has been the biggest change within you since we crush bold together? Ooh, um, getting rid of my excuses. I've really tried to be better at um, following through, you know, honoring those commitments, saying I'm going to do something and no excuses, get it done. Mm. You know, I, I think beforehand, I didn't realize how much I was excusing myself from things and no more. I love it. So who has been a role model and mentor in your life and what lesson did they teach you? Ooh. Um, I have a lot, you know, and I think my greatest ones would probably be my sisters and my parents. Um, not to leave my brothers out. I have a ton with them, but you know, I, as a girl, you look up to girls. You ho I hope so. And, you know, the first female coach I really had was in high school. Um, and I didn't have any female teachers, some in high school, but a couple in college, you know, I don't know. I just, I didn't have, I didn't have as many throughout my life as others. And um, anyway, so my, my older sisters, you know, they're 11 to 13 years older than me. And I just remember kind of watching them and, you know, they would mess up and they'd come back and say, now don't do what I did. You know, I did this and I got myself in credit card, you know, debt. And now I'm digging myself out of hole. Don't ever do that. Well, I've never done that, you know, Hey, this guy was a jerk to me, blah, blah, blah. Don't ever let that happen to you. You know, I mean, they really kind of taught me and talked to me. Um, you know, you play what you want to play. You wear what you want to wear. You know, you want to be the girl with the messy bun, be the girl with the messy bun, you know? And so they were, um, they were awesome about that. And, and credit to my brothers, because they were too, you know, they totally accepted me as I was and, and, you know, and then with my parents, um, you know, they just always instilled in us that, you know, the concept, instead of building a fence, make a longer table. Ooh. Anyone was welcome in our home. We could bring people over and mom would throw some more plates on the table. What's a couple more plates, you know? Um, they used to bring college students over and international players and people who didn't have somewhere to go for Thanksgiving and Christmas. We were always bringing in anybody who needed a family and people to love them. And my parents just lived with this and they still do this constant selfless compassion for people around them and looking around, noticing a need. And instead of waiting for permission or waiting for someone to tell them what to do, they just take action and just do it, do it unconditionally without asking anything in return and in turn teaching us as children that everybody matters nobody's better than anybody else it doesn't matter what car you drive what clothes you wear what house you live in what job you have it doesn't matter everybody is important everybody is valued i love that instead of building a fence let's build a bigger table could you imagine what would happen if we did that we wouldn't have this crap. Yeah. So I'm going to bring up um, the feedback poll as we get ready to end. And for you, Kate, your last words, what do you want? Like, what's your, what difference do you want to make? What's that legacy that you want to leave? 
I want everybody to know that they're enough, that the standards and, and value you put on yourself is yours. Nobody else can diminish that or change it or impact that for you. You know, you set that and by gosh, it should be freaking high. You deserve it. We all deserve it. We deserve joy and love and happiness. We deserve, you know, all the good things that life has to offer. And we deserve to do that with people around us. And, and nobody is better than anybody, you know, but one of the greatest, most common sentences I hear and I've heard, have heard for the last 12 years as a college coach is, I am not blank enough. Mm-hmm. Fill that in. Pretty, smart, fast, good, talented, thin, whatever. Fill in the blank. That's, that's what I've heard. And I want people to get rid of that word. Mm-hmm. I am enough. I'm enough. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't mean being complacent. It doesn't mean that you never try. It means that regardless of failures and successes, regardless of income or your house or your car, you love yourself. You are enough. And it is great to grow. It is great to be better. It is great to strive for all the things you want. But whether you reach it or not, it doesn't dictate whether or not you are less valuable. I have this, one of my affirmations I write all the time is I am enough period and I put the period because it is just like it doesn't matter yep yeah I just want to thank you for your heart and for showing up and I just oh my gosh just who you are the essence of Kate and I love you said I am Kate I'm Kate yeah I'm enough I am Kate period yeah well I know that the the young women that you get to work with, the little boys that you get to work with, the lives that you touch here in the business world, in the community, um, you're absolutely a role model and mentor. And just keep, keep on keeping on. And you know, and I know sometimes there's, um, there's ups and downs, so much discouragement. You guys aren't even, you're not even able to play right now. And that's part of the passion, right? Yeah. But this is the pause. It's like the power of the pause teaches yeah. us so much about who we are and what we want. Yeah. Well, and, and you know what? I, I have to say this because I'm realizing I didn't in my intro, but, you know, my wife, Christy, is my rock. Mm-hmm. And I would, I would not do her justice if I didn't give her that. But also to other people, the relationships, whether it's friendships, business partners, spouses, significant others, part, life partners, whatever, um, we need to be with people who see our value, even when we struggle to see it ourselves. And they respect us and they treat us with that infinite value, that worth of being a child of God. And, you know, that's, that's how we have to treat each other. And you want to be with somebody like that. And I'm very lucky to have that. Well said. Well said. All right, Kate, until next time. Again, thank you so much. And for those of you watching next uh, Tuesday at 1130, we will have Sophia Rose Alexander on. And have an amazing rest of your week. And remember, you're enough and you're valuable just the way that you are. That's right. Bye for now.